Good morning, Bayshore. Are you guys excited to be here? It's so good to see you. If we haven't met before, my name is Cotter, and I'm the Next Steps pastor. And uh, how, how many of you guys were here for Easter last week? Man, what an amazing day. We had so much fun at church last week, and then uh, after church, went home, and my wife and I, we did like an Easter egg hunt in our backyard for our son. He was like running around, picking up the Easter eggs, and then we did a, uh, like an Easter basket hunt for him inside, and that was so cool. It's like the first time he's been able to like move around and, and do that. He couldn't really do that a year ago. So, uh, so that was like really cool, and it just reminded me of like when I was a kid, every year we would go up to my grandparents' house, and we would do an Easter egg hunt after church. And Easter mornings, we'd wake up, and my brother and sister and I would be looking for our Easter baskets. And I remember, like, finding their baskets before mine, but they were, like, labeled. So even though I had their basket, I wasn't allowed to eat any of the candy. It was kind of worthless. I just had to put it back. And when I finally found my basket, I would eat as much candy as I could before we went to church. That was my number one goal. And then any candy I couldn't eat, I would put back in the Easter eggs, shove it in my pocket, take it to church, and eat it while I was at church. And I really think that like my love for candy came from Easter Sundays. I probably should say my love for Jesus came for Easter Sundays, but honestly, when I was a kid, I was just kind of like focused on the, the candy. And uh, so a few weeks ago, like right around the time that my wife and I's second son was born, we went over to Target and they had just put out all of their Easter candy. And if you've ever been to Target, when they put their candy out for a holiday like Easter or Christmas, they go all out. Like they have displays everywhere. They've got like any candy you can think of. And it was so cool. And, and at that time, Emily and I, like we were not sleeping. There were not a whole lot of things in life that didn't involve diaper changes and being vomited on. And, and so I just kind of needed something for myself that day, you know, like something to spoil myself, something I could get psyched about. And so I bought myself two things. I bought myself a box of Starburst and a box of Milk Duds. I know what you guys are thinking. The guy on the stage is five years old. And I understand that, but man, like I got these and it was life-changing. Like seriously, so amazing. Like I have, I've had Milk Duds before. I've had Starburst before, but I've never combined them and eat them at the exact same time. And like the chocolate and caramel combined with the fruity goodness, like absolutely amazing. And, and I was like, I tried them in the car. They're awesome. I went home. I ate every single piece that night. And then I added more boxes to my Walmart pickup order for that week. It was so good. Has anybody ever tried this before? No, you guys are looking at me like I'm crazy. That's kind of the response I've gotten from other people. I was, I was telling Joel about it and he was looking at me like I was crazy. I told Butch and he straight up told me I was crazy. I told Emily, and she didn't really say a whole lot. She just texted me the number for the dentist that she goes to. <laughs> Is there anybody here that, that thinks this sounds good and you want to try it? Anybody? I saw your hand go up first. Look. Sean, I got you Starburst. I got you Milk Duds. You got to try it out, man. And you got to let me know what you think, because your life is literally about to be changed forever. Now, I, I wish I could tell you guys, like, our, our message today was titled something cool, like Milk Duds and Jesus, or, uh, or Jesus is Star Bursting with Forgiveness. I thought about that one. That's pretty good. But there's, there's really no connection at all between the candy I'm obsessed with and our message. I just wanted to give somebody candy so you could experience the awesomeness that I've been experiencing in my life lately. Um, so I'm trusting you, man. You got to try it out. You got to text me this week and let me know what you think about it. Um, something else that I think is awesome is our online family. So can you guys help me in making some noise for everybody online? We got people that join us from all over the world, all over the country that listen through the podcast. And so it's great to have everybody that's not in the building with us today. Um, and so last Sunday was so great because of candy, but it was mainly great because it was Easter and we were celebrating Jesus and how he rose from the grave. He gave us new life. And, and so we spent last Sunday talking about the prodigal son, the man who ran away from his home and his family and, and, and just totally abandoned them. But then when he returned, they still loved him and cared about him. And, and we talked about how Jesus has that same joy and grace and forgiveness for us when we return to him. And, 
And so today we're going to be looking at something that happened a few chapters after that story of the prodigal son. So that was in Luke chapter 11 that we were reading last week. And today we're going to look at Luke chapter 17. And uh, we'd love for you to follow along in your Bible this morning. We'll have it up on the screen. You can follow along in the Bible app if you want. We also have free Bibles out in the lobby. So if you need a Bible or if you have a friend that needs a Bible, please grab one before you leave. So let's check this out. It says, now on his way to Jerusalem... Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So Jesus is traveling when this group of men call out to him. And and these verses say that that these men had leprosy, which was a, a skin disease that basically made them complete outcasts from society. They weren't allowed to live around everyone else. They were just isolated out all by themselves. And and so these people, they they see Jesus coming at a distance and they call out, they they ask him to heal them. And, And by asking for healing, by calling out to Jesus and calling him master, they're saying, look, Jesus, like we know who you are and we believe that you're capable of healing us. And so Jesus responded by telling them to go and show themselves to the priest. Now, when you were cleansed of leprosy, you had to go to the priest before you could go back into society and, and get back to your normal life. And so what Jesus is basically saying is, look, you're, you're going to be cleansed. And, and they weren't cleansed in that moment, but he was promising that they would be healed. But to show that they believed that Jesus could really heal them, they had to start their journey to the priest before they actually experienced that healing. They had to act before they actually saw that healing happen. Now, they believed him, and and so they went on their way to the priests, and on their way, all ten of them were healed of their leprosy. And, And when they were healed, nine of them just continued on. They kept going to the priests, but one of them stopped, and he turned back, and he returned to Jesus to praise him and to thank him for the healing that he received. And, and we see Jesus perform miracles and heal people all the time in the Bible. And so sometimes it's easy to just read it and, and kind of move on and not think a whole lot of it. But this is such a big deal. Like Jesus stopped for these men and he completely changed 10 people's lives that day in an instant. And he had the power to do that, and he just chose to have mercy on these people. And I think there's so many things that are very valuable for us to take away from this. These men, they were, they were rejects of society. Nobody would associate them. Nobody would talk to them. They were separated from everyone else. But Jesus, when he saw them, he stopped, and he took the time to talk to them and to heal them. And, and he saw their faith, and he gave them a second chance at life, and in their lives, like, they, they didn't have anything to look forward to. They didn't have any joy. They were just isolated and alone. But then when they saw Jesus, they believed he was the Son of God, and, and that faith changed everything. You know, these men, they had, to, they had to make a choice to place their faith in Jesus. Verse 13 says that they, they chose to call out to him. It says that they, when they called out to him, they called him master, and they were They were asking for Jesus to heal them. They're asking for him to change their situation. And and that's exactly what he did. He he saw their faith and and then he healed them. And and through that healing, he gave them hope. He gave them freedom and he gave them purpose. And and here's what we can see from this. What we can see in the story is that trusting Jesus changes everything. When we trust Jesus, it changes everything. Our whole lives change change when we place our trust in Jesus. Living for Jesus, it gives us hope. It gives us purpose. It gives us a a future. It gives us motivation to to push through our challenges. It gives us strength to overcome things that we're struggling with. It, It changes our whole reality because we experience things in life that can feel super overwhelming, things that feel way too big for us to handle. But when our trust is in Jesus, 
We have confidence that while we may not have all of the answers for the problems in our lives, we know that Jesus does have those answers. And we may not see good outcomes for our lives, but we know that Jesus does. And we may not see a purpose for our pain, but, but Jesus does. Now, Emily and I, we got married about eight years ago. Um, and here's a picture of us. We were just two little kids getting married. Um, and when I think about it being eight years ago, that makes me feel crazy old. Like really old. Like way too old to be eating milk duds and Starburst at night. Um, and so this is, this is a picture of us from when we first got married. And uh, so that was like in the summer. And then uh, that Christmas, we did like our first uh, like family vacation kind of thing. Like first like vacation with the in-laws and all that kind of stuff. So it's a big deal. And Emily's family had this tradition where uh, they would always go to Deep Creek, Maryland for Christmas every year. Has anybody been to, to Deep Creek? Really, really cool place. And I'd never been there before. So they were telling me about this trip and it sounded so awesome. We were basically going to go up to this house that was up in the mountains, this huge house, and we were just going to hang out, snowboard for a week. We were going to go to a Christmas tree farm and cut down a Christmas tree. I thought all Christmas trees just came from Walmart, but apparently there's trees where, or like farms where you can get them. So we're going to go out and cut down our tree. We're going to hang out in this cabin and just hang out on this mountain. It was just going to be a really awesome week. And, uh, it all sounded awesome. And at this time, Emily was in school still. So she was like full time in school. She'd do like some work after school at, at night, just some like part time stuff. But uh, my job was kind of bringing in all of our income at that time. So we found out like two, three weeks before we went on this trip, uh, I found out that my contract for the next year was not going to be renewed. Um, so basically, January 1st, I wasn't going to have a job. And so we were going on this trip for Christmas. We were going to get back, and like three days later, we were going to be, you know, kind of in a, a really sketchy situation. So I, I applied to like 50 jobs and got zero calls back. And so we went on this trip, and, and I was just like completely stressed out. We were going on like our dream vacation for Christmas, and I remember I, I was just like struggling. I remember everybody was downstairs. They're making gingerbread houses and singing Christmas carols, and I'm upstairs just like staring at the wall like... How are we going to pay the bills? How are we going to pay our rent? How are we going to pay for gas to get Emily to school? Like, how are we going to keep our electric on? Like, what are we going to do? And, and I didn't have any answers for any of that. And it was just a really scary spot to be in. And, and we all have those moments in life. We go through, like, really challenging times, and our, our circumstances just feel hopeless, and, and we don't have the ability to fix the situation we're in. And, and I imagine that's the spot that these men were in when they were calling out to Jesus. They were isolated. They were alone. They didn't have any hope. But then Jesus showed up, and everything changed for them. And, and what happens for us when Jesus shows up is that everything changes in our lives. We become filled with confidence that God is bigger than our situation. We can look at God and say, if Jesus rose from the dead, then God has the power to, to change my financial situation. And if God can bring the, the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, then he has the power to heal my marriage. And we can, we can look back and say, look, I, I know in the Bible God promises time and time again that he cares about me, that he loves me, that he has a plan for my life. So when I feel hopeless and depressed and anxious, I can be confident that God will bring me through whatever I'm facing, and he's going to fill me with whatever I need to get through that next day. When we place our trust in Jesus, it, it doesn't make all of our problems go away, but it does change everything about how we see our situation. You know, these men, they were, they were living with leprosy. They were, they were just in a, a nightmare every single day. But when they saw Jesus walking by, they knew he could change their situation, and they believed he could heal them and restore them. And that's what faith is. It's trusting in Jesus. It's, it's looking beyond our circumstances and believing that God is greater than what we're facing. And, and so if you're here today and you haven't placed your faith in Jesus, there's no reason to wait. There's no reason to go through another day trying to figure things out on your own. You might think, well, why would Jesus even care about me? Well, Jesus care about, cared about these men who were lepers, men who were completely isolated. They were rejects from society. Nobody cared about them, but Jesus did. 
He took the time to stop what he was doing and to talk to them and to heal them. And and so no matter what your past looks like, no matter what baggage you walk down those stairs into the basement with today, Jesus wants a relationship with you. He wants to be by your side through the good times in life. He wants to be by your side through the hard times in life. And so if you haven't placed your trust in Jesus, this is the moment to start because trusting in Jesus, it changes everything. So these men, they they went through each day, they were struggling, they were isolated, but the moment Jesus showed up, everything changed, they had new life, they had hope, and and so let's see how they responded to this healing. Let's look back at the story, starting in verse 14. We can put this up on the screen. It says, when Jesus saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. As they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And so these men, they were promised healing. Jesus said, go and show yourselves to the priest. That was him saying, look, you are going to be healed. You just start this journey and and you go to the priest. They're going to allow you back into society. You're going to be healed. And at that time, they still had leprosy, but they, they didn't experience the healing yet. But they started out their journey in faith. And along the way, all of them were healed, but the response of nine of the men was just to to keep going to the priest to get their old lives back. But one of them stopped. One of them stopped when he saw that he had been healed. Verse 15 says, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back. And this is a really important point. This man, when, when he saw he had been healed, his priority was returning to Jesus to thank him for the blessing he received. Isn't that awesome? Like he he had just received like the miracle he had been waiting his whole life for and and his whole life had been changed. He had hope again. He could go back to his old life. He could actually be around people. And his response wasn't, what do I get out of this? His response wasn't, how do I benefit from this? Instead, his response was to return to Jesus and to thank him for the healing that he received. All 10 of these men received the same blessing but only one of them returned to Jesus. And, and it says that this man, when he returned to Jesus, says he, he threw himself at Jesus' feet, he thanked Jesus, and he came back praising God in a loud voice. So uh, a couple weekends ago, um, Emily and I, we went down to my parents' house, and my brother and his family had come up. They lived down in Virginia. And so they had come up. They wanted to see our son, Indy, who was just born a couple months ago. And uh, so they came up. We were all just kind of hanging out by the fire and having a good time. And, like, the kids were all running around and playing. And, and so we got home that night, and, like, we were so exhausted, and, and Taj was exhausted. And so we put him to bed, and then we came downstairs. Indy fell asleep, thankfully, and, uh, and Emily and I just totally crashed on the couch. And so I, I hopped on the couch, and I turned on March Madness. I was watching the Final Four, and uh, Emily was watching something on her phone or reading on her phone. And uh, we're sitting there, and, and we got an alert on our phone that said that there was a severe thunderstorm coming. And so there was supposed to be all of this stuff that was, that was coming. And so I got up and I went outside and I just kind of made sure that everything was kind of in order, made sure that we weren't going to have any damage outside, nothing would blow away. And uh, so I was getting everything in order and then I came back inside and, and then our phones just went crazy, like crazy alert sounds. And, and something you guys might not know about me is I'm a big time weather nerd, like a big time weather nerd. Most kids, when they get home from school, want to play like Fortnite and Call of Duty. When I would get home as a kid, I would just turn on the weather channel for hours. Watch my boy Jim Cantori hanging from tree limbs during hurricanes. Like, I love the Weather Channel. Emily and I were were driving yesterday, and I'm like pointing out different cloud types to her and talking to her about weather patterns and all kinds of nerdy stuff. And so when when I got this uh, alert on my phone, I knew exactly what it was. And it was a a tornado warning. And I'll show you guys the, the picture of that that we got. So it's like, seek shelter now. Like, take shelter inside and and get away from outside. And like, there's the big tornado warning. And, um, and so when we saw this, like we went full fight or flight mode. Since I'm a weather nerd, we have a tornado plan. So we knew exactly what to do. And so Emily grabbed Indy. She grabbed some supplies. She went into this, uh, like our smallest room, which is our downstairs bathroom, which is like this big. It is the tiniest room in, in any building in the world. And, uh, and so they went in there and uh, I like sprinted upstairs and I woke up our son Taj and like grabbed him and I'm like running through the hall with him. And like the storm was crazy outside. Like 
There's like hail beating on the windows, lightning and thunder, like the wind was crazy and it was like so sketchy. And so I'm running down there and, and I get him in there and like we're all huddled up in this tiny little bathroom and, and I pulled on my phone to kind of watch the news and, and see what was going on. And the area that they were concerned about for, for tornadoes was like this two mile stretch and our house was right in the middle of it. And so we were like, we were kind of panicking. And so we're, you know, we didn't want to like freak the kids out. And so we're like praying and we're, we're singing to them. And um, we're just trying to like get through this situation. And, and thankfully, after like 20 minutes, everything was okay. Like there was no damage or anything. We could kind of come out and everything was all right. But, but I was still kind of like in a weird spot after that. Like we've been so panicked. And, and so literally for the next two days, I was just thanking God for everything. I was like, thank you, God, for the carpet. And thank you, God, for like our refrigerator and, and literally everything. I woke up the next morning before church and I was like, thank you, God, for my coffee. Thank you for my uh, chocolate chip Lara bar that I eat for breakfast every morning. Thank you for shoelaces that are holding my shoes together. Like, I was thanking God for, for literally everything. And, and look, I think the 10 men in the story were, or had a moment after they were healed where they were really thankful. I think they all had a moment where they were grateful for what Jesus done because they had reached out to him. They knew who healed him. They knew what they had been healed from. And and I'm sure that they were thankful. But the difference between their response and and this one man is that the nine men, they weren't grateful for very long. But the one man, he was grateful for longer than just a moment. He wasn't just thanking God for a few minutes or hours after his life was changed. His entire life became centered around gratitude for the blessing that he received. So much so that that he didn't go to the priests. He didn't go to get his life back. Instead, he just turned around and he went straight to Jesus. He, He didn't care about what he had gained. He only cared about praising God. And and when we read this section, the Bible says that he came back praising God in a loud voice, that he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And and those are qualities that should define our lives. Thankfulness, praise, and a recognition that Jesus is the one true holy God, which is a, a long way of saying worship. And that thankfulness, praise, and worship, it shouldn't just define us for a moment. It shouldn't be like me after that tornado where I was just like thanking God for anything I could think of for a few hours. Thankfulness, praise, and worship, it shouldn't be something we're temporarily focused on. It should be the foundation of our lives. And so this morning for our message points, we've got two practical ways that we can respond right now to Jesus to show him thankfulness, praise, and worship. And so the first way that we respond to Jesus' love is to serve people. We serve people. Now look back at verse 11 with me. We'll put this up. It says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. So Jesus is traveling. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on like the Jerusalem Route 24. And he's behind all these people with Sumerian license plates on their donkeys. And they're going like 30 miles under the speed limit. And he's going through all 75,000 construction zones. He's stopping all the new random lights that they're putting up everywhere. And, uh, and Jesus just has, he has all these things on his mind about his travel and where he's going. And instead of being caught up in his plans, he, he stopped and he took the time to, to talk to these men that are calling out to him. And so he heard them and then he stopped for them and he, and he helped them. He heard them, he stopped for them and he helped them. And none of those things got Jesus to Jerusalem faster None of those things were in line with helping him get his tasks accomplished or get where he wanted to go, but he stopped and he took the time to serve these people. And so often throughout my week, I just get caught up in where I'm going, what I need to get done, and and I'm not focused on who is around me. I'm not focused on what is going on around me, but but Jesus was. He was willing to set aside his plans to stop what he was doing for these people and those few moments that he took, it ended up changing the lives of 10 people. You know, he didn't need to stop for them, but he did it because he wanted to make their lives better. And, and Jesus has made our lives better. 
He's given us a second chance at life. He's given us joy and hope, and we can show our appreciation for that by following his example and serving the people around us. And and that's what our upcoming Serve Day is all about. It is a day where we're going to go into our local community to help people and to bless them. It's it's one Saturday morning where we're going to hit the pause button on our busy lives so that we can meet some practical needs for people. And, And I'm really excited about this. I think it's so cool that we as a church have an opportunity to help people together. You know, we live in a time where every single minute of our days is is scheduled out in our Google calendars, and there's a million things we need to get done every single day. And so the idea of us taking one Saturday, hitting the pause button on our schedules, hitting the pause button on our kids' schedules, and just focusing on serving people, I think that's really cool. You know, Jesus models for us in this story how important it is to stop and to prioritize other people. It's important to hit the pause button on our commitments and prioritize helping people out. Now, Jesus cared about these 10 men when nobody else would. Nobody else would take the time to stop for these outcasts. And Jesus himself, he could have walked by. He could have ignored them and kept on going where he needed to get to, but instead he set aside his plans to serve them. And so my first challenge for us today is to set aside time to serve people on April 29th for our serve day. That's the day, April 29th. It's going to be uh, about 8 a.m. until like 1 or 2, which would be 5 or 6 hours, one morning. And we can set aside time that day to show other people the impact that Jesus has had on our lives. And, and look, I know if you've got kids, like I know there's soccer on Saturdays, there's baseball on Saturdays, you've got birthday parties and all kinds of things that, that fill up your schedules. And, and I get it, like I played sports from when I was five years old until all the way through high school. I know those are important commitments, but, but man, how important is it to take one day off of our schedules to serve people? I think that's worth it. I think taking one day off of our normal Saturday schedules to model for our families how important it is to serve people, I think that's worth it. And, and look, if you want to get involved with our serve day, you guys have heard the announcements. It's so easy. You can go to the kiosks after the service. You type bayshore.online into your phone or on your computer if you're at home, and, and you just click on serve day. There's all the different opportunities that we have to get involved. You just pick the one that sounds fun to you. And and then we show up on that day. We're going to feed you guys breakfast. Then we're going to go out. We're going to love our community together. And then we're going to come back. We'll feed you lunch. And we'll talk about how how much fun we got to have serving our community. And it's it's one day where we can show up. And we can show our love for Jesus by helping other people. So that is our first response to Jesus' love. It is serving others. Others. Now look back with me at the story. We'll put up verse 15. Verse 15 says, One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, We're not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? So the nine men, they kept on going. Like they received their healing and they got the all clear. They just wanted to keep going to the priest so they could return to their lives. But this one guy, he turned around, he returned to Jesus. And and we saw how he came back praising God. He threw himself at Jesus' feet to worship him and thank him. And we saw how important those attitudes of praise and thankfulness and worship are. And, And there's another thing that's really important that I want us to see here. The one who returned... His focus was on Jesus. The other nine men, they were focused on what they got from Jesus. See the difference? The the one man, he only cared about who healed him rather than what he would gain from being healed. But the other nine, they just cared about how their lives were going to be better because of the healing they received. And so our second practical point today of of how we can respond to Jesus' love is is to celebrate Jesus. We celebrate Jesus. And and here's how we do that. We celebrate Jesus by learning more about him, by telling other people about him, and by worshiping him. We, We celebrate Jesus by learning more about him, by telling other people about him, and by worshiping him. And and the best way to do all of those things is, is something that we have here at church called Next Steps. 
Next Steps is a a four-session class that we do. Each one of these four sessions are about an hour long, and in each session we focus on something different. So we focus on the basics of our faith, what it means to be a Jesus follower. We focus on why church is important and how you can get more involved. We focus on what we believe about God, who he is, why the Bible is important, what prayer is, and, and why small groups are important. And then we focus on how our lives are different when we're serving Jesus, surrounded by other Jesus followers at church, and placing our faith in him each day. And Next, is, next Steps is something we do about four times a year. Sometimes we'll take a month and do it on Sundays. Sometimes we'll take um, a Saturday and just do all four sessions in one day. And I tell you guys all the time like how excited I am about Next Steps, how I think it's one of the coolest things we do here. And you guys are probably like, yeah, because you're the Next Steps pastor. You literally have to be excited about that. But, but that's not the only reason I'm excited about it. Like, Next Steps is a big deal to me because of the life change that I've seen in you guys when you've been through Next Steps. So Amy and Butch, we got a picture of them we can put up. It says, Amy and Butch, I'm sure you saw them as you were coming in today because they serve with us literally every single Sunday almost. And uh, they were part of the first Next Steps class that I did back in 2019. And uh, they are part of almost all of our serving teams. They serve almost every Sunday of the year. They literally plan their family vacations around Sundays so that they can be a part of church. And, uh, and one of the coolest things about Amy and Butch is that they invite any person that they meet to church. They invite their friends, their family. They invite people they meet at work. Emily was, or, uh, Amy was just telling me before the service about some other person that, that she invited because Amy and Butch came to Bayshore, their lives were changed, and they came to Next Steps and they built a faith foundation and now they're impacting other people because of that. I got a picture of Chris we can put up. Chris went through Next Steps back in February of 2021. This is a picture of Chris getting baptized And Chris is a a paramedic. He's amazing. He's literally putting his life on the line every single day. Right now, he's working, putting his life on the line for other people. And Chris uh, wrote a book about being a paramedic and how in that profession, you can experience depression and anxiety because of the things you you see and and go through. And, And he wrote about how Jesus is the answer to those things. Chris is amazing. Chris serves with us all the time, whether he is uh, going down the street to the movie theater and handing out invite cards to people or dressing up as the Easter bunny or passing the, the offering plates around. He's led groups. He led our camping trip last fall. And Chris built his faith foundation at Next Steps. We got a picture of Paul we can put up. Paul went through Next Steps in uh, 2021 as well. And, and now he leads the classes. In February, he literally led our Next Steps classes with, um, with my friend Steve. And, and so Paul is Paul's amazing. He serves at the shepherd's house during the week leading worship. He has started multiple small groups. And, and Paul does amazing things at his accounting business where his faith impacts how he runs his business and what he does with his time and his money. Uh, Paul serves on all of our guest services teams. And Paul built his faith foundation at Next Steps. Look, real life change happens here in the basement on Sunday mornings. And our response to that life change is to build a foundation for our faith so that we're not just Jesus followers for one day or for a week or for a month or or a couple years. We want to be Jesus followers for the rest of our lives. And so we need a foundation for our faith. and, And that comes from next steps. So practical challenge number two for you this morning is to sign up for next steps. It's May 6th. We can put that slide up. It's May 6th. We're going to start at 8.30. We're going to have coffee for you. I will have Chick-fil-A breakfast for you. It'll be an amazing morning. We will hang out. We will learn about Jesus. We will learn about each other, and you will build a foundation for your faith. This is one morning that you can take, one Saturday morning where you can build a lasting foundation for your relationship with Jesus. One morning to celebrate what Jesus has done in your life by learning more about him. And just like Serve Day, you can sign up for Next Steps at the kiosk out in the lobby by going to bayshore.online. Now, how many sports fans do we have in the room? All right, now uh, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up for me. So uh, how many of you are baseball fans? More people than I thought. This might not be popular. I think baseball is really boring. 
Um, so don't be mad at me, Bing, don't be mad at me. Um, I'll, I'll explain why I think baseball is boring. I'm a Phillies fan. Uh, the Phillies lost 13-0 to zero yesterday. That kind of describes what it means to be a Phillies fan. They're terrible. They are just a terrible team. So when your team's terrible, like you think the sport is terrible, like Cowboys fans, you probably understand a little bit of, of what that's like. But uh, last year, something amazing happened. The Phillies made the playoffs for the first time since 2011. And it was a, it was a huge deal. I was so excited about this. And, uh, and they started advancing through a couple of rounds. Like they, they were doing really well. And I've, I've always been a big Phillies fan. Like I've seen the Phillies play in Philadelphia a couple of times in my life. I've seen them uh, over in D.C. I've traveled down to Clearwater, Florida to watch them play in spring training. I'm a huge Phillies fan, but... One thing I've never done is see the Phillies in a playoff game. And so uh, last year, they were like doing really good. And, and I was like, this might be the first time, you know, like they, they were good one time. The only time in my entire life the Phillies have ever made the playoffs was when I was in college and I was super broke in college. So I couldn't go see them then. And so last year, you know, they were doing good. They were progressing and, and I got so into it. And so I was like, I am going to go to a game. And so I went online and I was trying to find seats and I was like looking for the best view and ended up being in a really cool situation where I was able to go with my sister and my brother-in-law and my brother. And, uh, and we got a picture of us that we, uh, from the game that we went to. So this is my brother here on the left. And then Bo, who's, our, uh, who's been our worship leader for like nine years, he um, is my brother-in-law and then my sister Katie and then me. And uh, this was like the coolest experience and so the game that we went to, this was the third game of the NLCS, which is like, if you're not into baseball, I don't blame you, um, it's like the, the semifinals for, like, for baseball playoffs. It was a really, really big deal. Um, so we were so excited. Everyone in the stadium had their Phillies gear on, except like four Padres fans, and we were all booing the Padres fans when we saw them. Um, so this game was, was super intense. The Phillies ended up winning 4-2. to two, And when they won, like the place went nuts. There were 45,000 people in the stands and everyone was so excited. And, uh, and so the, after the game, like we're all like walking to the parking lot and everybody's just like so excited. And we got back to the car. We sat, uh, not in the parking lot, we sat in our parking space for two hours trying to get out of, of the parking lot because of how crazy all the traffic was. And we didn't care at all because the Phillies won. We were so excited. We were like, it doesn't matter how long we sit in traffic. And look, Easter is all about how Jesus has won for us. Jesus has secured our victory. He gave up his life, dying on the cross for our sins. But, but what he did on Easter was, was the deal breaker because he, he not only died for us, but he resurrected. He came back to life. And, and by doing that, he showed that he's greater than death. He shows that he's greater than all things. And look, Jesus loves you. He proved that to you by dying on the cross for you. And, and Jesus has grace and forgiveness for you. And he proved that he's capable of forgiving our sins when he raised from the dead. So what do we do in response to that? What do we do in response to Jesus' love for us? We serve others and we celebrate Jesus. We get involved serving the community on Serve Day to show Jesus' love to other people. And we get involved with next steps so that we can build a foundation for our relationship with him. After the, the Phillies won and I finally got out of, of all of that traffic and got back home, I went online and I bought myself a, a Bryce Harper Phillies jersey. because so I was so excited and I was like, I just, everybody needs to know that I'm a Phillies fan because the Phillies are amazing. Everybody, everybody needs to know how amazing they are. And, and look, when, when we love Jesus, when we are Jesus followers, we show other people how much Jesus means to us by serving them and by growing in our relationship with Jesus. So before you leave today, I want to challenge you to put your faith into action by signing up for Serve Day, signing up for Next Steps. Build that foundation of faith in your life and show other people how much Jesus has impacted your life by serving them. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for today, and um, I thank you so much for this story where we can see your compassion for people and your compassion for people who are outcasts and people that no one else cares about. And I thank you that you care about us even though we feel like you shouldn't care about us because we're, we're imperfect and we're broken, but, but you love us and, and you care so much about us. And, and God, I pray that we'll show other people the love that, that we have for you by serving them 
I pray that you will help us to build a foundation of, of faith in our lives by learning more about you and telling other people about you. I pray all this in your name. Amen.